I started with tanks that don't exist. I moved on to tanks that I want to make sweet, sweet love to. Mm -hmm. I recently finished calling Russia's 300 IQ leader a tiny dicked tin pot dictator with delusions of grandeur. Now, they must have found oil in my backyard because I'm going to bring you some democracy, whether you want it or not. It's time to get your freedom on. It's the General Dynamics Land System Mobile Protected Firepower. Another star spangled episode of a tank review with me, Zero. It's time to saddle up your bald eagles and fly into battle, because the first time in 60 years, America has chosen a new light tank to complement its infantry with faster and more mobile direct firepower support in future combat operations. Now, before I carry on with the video, I'd like to address some viewer comments made on my P 14 Armada video. I wish I had the foresight to screen cap it or something like that, but I really wasn't thinking much or anything at all because I was running a pretty good fever with COVID. Anyway, moving on. This individual more or less accused me of shit-hosing Russians while giving NATO a free pass on technology. Now, and some really oddball comments about artillery and something about the cult of light infantry. Now, I'm going to address this all in turn. Now, Firstly, NATO actually makes an effort to improve their doctrine along with their technological advances. They work ways to work it into the system. Now, I've got a fair amount of expertise and experience in this because we used to change doctrines and SOPs mid-tour, mid-exercise. As it comes up, we change, we do it. That's the way it is. All right, We have to ever be able to adapt to changing field conditions. For example, um, in Afghanistan, Russian and Chinese 107mm rockets could be fired into our FOBs at 3.5 to 4 kilometers. Most LAVs had an effective range of 2 to 3 kilometers and really couldn't engage the rocket teams effectively. Now, so we bring in Leopard tanks, 3 to 4 kilometer range. There we go. Now, the insurgents would set fire to fields in an, map, in an effect to try to mask themselves from our thermal, sig our thermal cameras. What did we do? We move the tanks on top of a mountain so we can see over the fires and still engage them. 3,300 yards. So we see the situation and we adapt. That's how NATO works. It may be a reactive passive strategy, but it works. So why change it? Now, Russian artillery. Really? Artillery is so effective that after six months of fighting now, seven months of fighting, they can't even secure two breakaway republics without literally turning to North Korea to get ammunition for their artillery. Russia, everybody! The part about the comment I think that bugged me the most was the third part, this cult of light infantry rant that he went on. Now, I hate to tell you, sweetheart, infantry is a hard job for hard people. And light infantry have always ruled the battlefield. They will continue to rule the battlefield well after you and I are long past dust, and they've ruled all the way past prehistory. Anyway, guys, rant over. Let's get back to our regularly scheduled Stark. Historical preamble. What is a light tank, I hear you ask? Well, pull up a seat. It's time for Professor Tony to take you all to school. A light tank is a tracked armored vehicle that bridges the gap between a main battle tank and an infantry fighting vehicle. They're meant to provide heavy caliber direct fire support to dismounted infantry, as well as scout ahead of the main force. They typically have a large enough gun to engage protected and reinforced bunkers and pillboxes and uh, fortifications and light armored vehicles without being able to engage main battle tanks. That's not their rule. They don't engage those. While it doesn't possess the armor of a main battle tank, they've got enough armor to turn small arms and light anti-armor fire. They were first experimented with in World War I, mostly embodied in the Renault FT-7, M3 Stuart, eventually culminating in the M551 Sheridan. Now, I tried to get a Vietnam vet to interview about uh, the Sheridan, but I never got a response to any of my inquiries. So if you see this, buddy, uh, shoot me a line. Um, I'd love to chat. Now, the M551 was a light tank, clocking at around 14 tons. It was capable of airborne deployment. It was put through the ringer in Vietnam, Panama, Grenada, and finally the first Gulf War. Uh, they were found to be really underwhelming. The gun was finicky and prone to failure if it launched its uh, tube-launched missiles, which uh, had a laughably low survivability rate. 
After a few attempts of upgrading and fixing it, uh, they eventually just quietly retired them in 1996 and phased them out of inventory entirely in 2003, leaving a serious gap in infantry fire support that they tried to fill with the striker. Now, it was supposed to be filled by other programs as well, but they kept being canceled due to budget constraints at the end of the Cold War. The program was finally restarted with the Mobile Protection Firepower Program. Initially, it was between BAE and GLDS, but BAE was disqualified because they couldn't deliver the product on time because of COVID-related supply chain issues. Where have we all heard that before? This left GLDS as a de facto winner, getting the contract to produce the first batch of 96 units. And realistically, this couldn't come at a better time. The U.S. Marines just decommissioned their Abrams fleet to focus back in amphibious warfare. This later tank could probably better fill that deployability role in future wars with near-peer adversaries. Technically, it's only the Army that's placed the first order, but if this program performs as well in combat as well on paper, I'm sure the Marines will probably order this program in the future to replace the aging striker gun system. The design. Speculation alert, everybody. For the life of me, I've looked high and low to the bowels of the internet, from r slash tank porn all the way to the War Thunder forums, and not much really has been revealed about the inner workings of this tank. So I'm going to infer what I can and piece together the best assessment I can of this new vehicle based on the pictures that are publicly available and using the available data that's on Wikipedia as best of resources that is. Now from the ground up I can tell you that this tank clocks in at 38 tons, putting it well inside medium tank territory as opposed to light tank territory, which is probably why the U.S. is not calling this a light tank instead of the mobile protected firepower system. Now it's rocking a six wheel torsion bar suspension the forward drive sprocket. Right off the hop, this tells me that the engine is probably right mounted forward in the hull, similar to the Ajax and other light armored vehicles of this class. Now, the engine for the Ajax is an MTU V8 putting out 600 kilowatts at 800 horsepower. It's very likely this will be the same engine mounted in the MPF, and 600 kilowatts should be more than sufficient to uh, power the networked equipment inside the turret, as well as active and passive sensors for countermeasures. Now, the armor composition is not mentioned in any of the reports yet, however, it is very likely that it's a variant of Chobham or other lighter steel ceramic composite armor. But given our final weight of 38 tons for this machine, I'm inclined to believe the former of a Chobham armor mixed with a ERA panel to assist in urban survivability, similar to the Tusk package. Ultimately, with projected top speed of 70 kilometers per hour forward and reverse, this stout, chonky little bastard, in theory, should provide enough of an edge to help counter its lighter armor with its speed. The Armament The main gun on the Griffin II is the XM35 105mm soft recoiled gun. What this means is it ejects its spent casings out of the rear of the turret like the Striker. While it accepts all 105mm standard NATO ammunition, it was designed to be used with a new multi-purpose round with a variable fusing this new smart programmable round actually replaces four separate ammunition types heat, hash, HEDP, and canister. Now, what that tells me is this variable fuse has already got a pre selected fragmentation pattern, which is pretty neat. Now, it's mounted with a 7.62 millimeter coax and a 50 BMG roof side, so the Griffin's got some majorly sharp talons. The gun system has the same laser range finder as the Challenger 2 and the GDLS ballistic computer which updates all known variables at a rate of 30 times per second to give the gun maximum first shot capability. Now the gun uses a 21 round auto loader with a 9 round onboard stowage. And I feel at this point I really should just give up on my hatred of all things auto loader, but I won't. Tangent time! You want to know why I hate the concept of an auto loader so much? I've been asked a few times. It's not that I'm opposed to technological advantage. I'm not some knuckle-dragging Luddite. Uh, the reason is actually kind of simple. The lack of room for emergency repairs or remediation during combat situations is why I hate autoloaders so much. Because of tank designers, usually when they include autoloaders, they eliminate the room of the loader itself to save room for armor and other uh, factors inside the turret. Now, they tend to leave a little room to get in there if you need to load the gun manually into graded mode but it's very tight, stress-inducing. You're wearing body armor. Your heart's going a million miles a minute. Now, in degraded mode, this can reduce your fire rate by as much as 60%. On top of that, your crew commander is already, if he's not already dead, he's now acting as your loader, 
which is already overtaxing his very, very overtaxed attention span because he's got to worry about the radios, what's going on, what's going on around him, etc. Now, before you break your fingers fiercely typing in the comments, yes, they work and they work reasonably well. But the one thing that suffers during budget cuts is maintenance and especially for heavy gear. Now, it's just a bad cost benefit analysis. Why spend $20,000 a day to fix and run a tank when you can spend that to run an entire platoon of infantry instead? It's just the math of governments and the armies rolled over, and we're actually seeing that a lot right now with the Russian army in Ukraine. Now, that's my logic with standard tank guns and auto loaders. I feel that a loader, a human loader, is far more effective and, well, quite frankly, a little bit more replaceable in a situation like that. Say your loader's knocked out, it's easier to put a new person in there it is than it is to get someone in there and fix a very complicated machine. Anyways, Tangent rant over. If the auto loader is taken offline, it's reported that the Griffin 2 is able to fire three rounds a minute being loaded manually. Uh, there's no mention of powder load and barrel pressures, so I can't speculate on how close infantry can get uh, to the forward third of the tank when it fires. Uh, the technology demonstrator had a pepper box muzzle brake on it. The uh, production models apparently don't have any muzzle brake whatsoever. Now, I can tell you with absolute certainty on a standard L7 105mm gun that if any infantry were past the third road wheel on a tank on the forward third, the concussive force of that gun had a very serious chance of causing major injuries, traumatic brain injuries, uh, concussion, soft tissue damage, blown eardrums. Uh, it's just a thing that happens. Now, the 105mm turret doesn't have a spot for the switchblade launcher like the 120mm technolo technology demonstrator turret, that's a mouthful. Uh, but I imagine this would be a feature addition to the turret would allow it on there, as the turret ring and power pack obviously allow for an increase of digital flow and network integration. So far, there's no mention of APS such as Trophy or Iron Fist, but uh, given the layout of the exterior of the turret, it would appear that uh, provisions have already been made for it to be added on. But nothing is said this time of what it is. However, it has been mentioned that it does have Rheinmetall's Rosy Obscurance system installed on it. And the detector rays can be seen at the rear of the turret with on the rear antenna with what's likely the ECM suite on there as well. Final thoughts. Ultimately, while I think the size of this places it firmly as a medium tank as opposed to a light tank or even a gun carriage like the Striker, it's still going to fill a very much needed role in future fights, especially with the new focus on competing with near peer adversaries who've already filled this role and integrated these units into their mechanized infantry already. While it's not exactly air deployable like its M551 Sheridan Forebear at clocking in at 14 to 18 tons, it is still air transportable as two per on a uh, C17 starter lifter and as well as on an LCAC. So, I'd like to see this thing in the future. I hope that uh, this project doesn't get canceled. And if you guys like that, if you like this content, uh, give me the big old thumbs up. And with that, guys, I will see you on the next battlefield. Peace.